Greetings, this is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. And this is a series of readings from and brief notes and commentary upon Augustine of Hippo's Harmony of the Evangelists. In this episode, we're going to be looking at Book 1, chapters 15 through 18. And we begin with chapter 15, which is titled, Of the fact that the pagans, when constrained to laud Christ, have launched their insults against his disciples. But what shall be said to this if those vain eulogizers of Christ and those crooked slanderers of the Christian religion lack the daring to blaspheme Christ for this particular reason that some of their philosophers, as Porphyry of Sicily, have given us to understand in his books, consulted their gods as to their response on the subject of the claims of Christ and were constrained by their own oracles to laud Christ. Nor should that seem incredible, for we also read in the gospel that the demons confessed him, and in our prophets it is written in this wise, for the gods of the nations are demons. Thus it happens then that in order to avoid attempting aught in opposition to the responses of their own deities, they turn their blasphemies aside from Christ and pour them forth against his disciples. It seems to me, however, that these gods of the Gentiles, whom the philosophers of the pagans may have consulted, if they, ha if they were asked to give their judgment on the disciples of Christ, as well as on Christ himself, would be constrained to praise them in like manner. Chapter 16, titled, Of the fact that, on the subject of the destruction of idols, the apostles taught nothing different from what was taught by Christ or by the prophets. Nevertheless, these persons argue still to the effect that this demolition of temples and this condemnation of sacrifices and this shattering of all images are brought about not in virtue of the doctrine of Christ himself, but only by the hand of his apostles, who, as they contend, taught something different from what he taught. They think by this device, while honoring and lauding Christ, to tear the Christian faith in pieces. For it is at least true that it is by the disciples of Christ that at once the works and the words of Christ have been made known, on which this Christian religion is established, with which a very few people of this character are still in antagonism, who do not now indeed openly assail it, but yet continue even in these days to utter their mutterings against it. But if they refuse to believe that Christ taught in the way indicated, let them read the prophets who not only enjoined the complete destruction of the superstitions of idols, but also predicted that this subversion would come to pass in Christian times. And if these spoke falsely, why is their word fulfilled with so mighty a demonstration? But if they spoke truly, why is resistance offered to such divine power? Chapter 17, titled, In Opposition to the Romans Who Rejected the God of Israel Alone. However, here is a matter which should meet with more careful consideration at their hands, namely, what they take the God of Israel to be, and why they have not admitted him to the honors and worship among them, in the way that they have done with the gods of other nations that have been made subject to the imperial power of Rome. This question demands an answer all the more when we see that they are of the mind that all the gods ought to be worshipped by the man of wisdom. Why then has he been excluded from the number of these? If he is very mighty, why is he the only deity that is not worshipped by them? If he has little or no might, why are the images of other gods broken in pieces by all the nations, while he is now almost the only god that is worshipped among the peoples? From the grasp of this question, these men shall never be able to extricate themselves, who worship both the greater and lesser deities, whom they hold to be gods, and at the same time refuse to worship this god, who has proved himself stronger than all those to whom they do service. If he is a god of great virtue, why has he been deemed worthy only of rejection? And if he is a god of little power or no power, why has he been able to accomplish so much, although rejected? If he is good, why is he the only one separated from the other good deities? And if he is evil, why is he who stands thus alone not subjugated by so many good deities? If he is truthful, why are his precepts scorned? And if he is a liar, why are his predictions fulfilled? Chapter 18, titled, of the fact that the God of the Hebrews is not received by the Romans, because his will is that he alone should be worshipped. In fine, they may think of him as they please. Still, 
we may ask whether it is the case that the Romans refused to consider e evil deities as also proper objects of worship. Those Romans who have erected fanes to pallor and fever, and who enjoin both that the good demons are to be entreated and that the evil demons are to be propitiated. Whatever their opinion, then, of him may be, the question still is, why is he the only deity whom they have judged worthy neither of being called upon for help nor of being propitiated? What god is this who is either one so unknown that he is the only one not discovered as yet among so many gods, or who is one so well known that he is now the only one worshipped by so many men? There remains then nothing which they can possibly allege in explanation of their refusal to admit the worship of this God, except that his will was that he alone should be worshipped. And his command was that those gods of the Gentiles that they were worshipping at the time should cease to be worshipped. But an answer to this other question is rather to be required of them, namely, what or what manner of deity they consider this God to be, who has forbidden the worship of other gods for whom they erected temples and images. This God, who has also been possessed of might so vast that his will has prevailed more in effecting the destruction of their images than theirs has availed to secure the non-admittance of his worship. And indeed, the opinion of that philosopher of theirs is given in plain terms, whom, even on the authority of their own oracle, they have maintained to have been the wisest of all men. For the opinion of Socrates is that every deity whatsoever ought to be worshipped just in the manner in which he may have ordained that he should be worshipped. Consequently, it became a matter of the supremest necessity with them to refuse to worship the God of the Hebrews. For if they were minded to worship him in a method different from the way in which he had declared that he ought to be worshipped, then assuredly they would have been worshipping not this God as he is, but some figment of their own. And on the other hand, if they were willing to worship him in the manner which he had indicated, then they could not but perceive that they were not at liberty to worship those other deities whom he interdicted them from worshiping. Thus was it, therefore, that they rejected the service of the one true God because they were afraid that they might offend the many false gods. For they thought that the anger of those deities would be more to their injury than the goodwill of this God would be to their profit. And this is going to bring to a close the reading of Book 1, uh, chapters 15 through 18 of Augustine's Harmony of the Evangelists. And we'll make a few notes and comments now on each one of these chapters, beginning with uh, Book 1 and Chapter 15, titled Of the Fact That the Pagans, When Constrained to Laud Christ, have launched their insults against his disciples. Augustine describes his pagan opponents as crooked slanderers. On one hand, they are vain eulogizers of Christ, while on the other hand, they pour out blasphemies against his disciples. Augustine notes in particular the attacks of Porphyry of Sicily, and he suggests that such pagan philosophers have been uh, led by their own demonic uh, gods, uh, he notes a parallel in the Gospels where the, um, the demons will uh, confess that they know uh, that Jesus is the Son of God. And so he says, similarly, these gods uh, tell the philosophers like Porphyry uh, that they are not to blaspheme Christ, but then they proceed and blaspheme instead his apostles. Um, in Book 1 and Chapter 16, titled of the fact that on the subject of the destruction of idols, the apostles taught nothing different from that which was taught by Christ or the prophets. Augustine continues to refute those who suggest that the doctrine of the apostles in their rejection of pagan temples and idols differed from the doctrine of Jesus himself. By trying to drive a wedge between Jesus and the apostles, they were attempting, as Augustine puts it, to tear the Christian faith in pieces. To Cinch's point, he notes that Jesus and the apostles taught nothing different regarding their rejection of pagan idolatry than did the Old Testament prophets. Chapter 1, uh, Book 1 and Chapter 17 is titled, In Opposition to the Romans Who Rejected the God of Israel Alone. Augusta next, next asks why the Romans refused to worship the God of Israel 
when they offer worship to all the gods of all the other nations? He asks a series of questions to challenge the Romans, beginning with the question, if he, the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, is very mighty, why is he the only deity that is not worshipped by them? He ends by asking, and if he, the same God, is a liar, why are his predictions fulfilled? His point is that the pagan Romans are inconsistent in their religious thinking and practice. Uh, then book one, chapter 18, which is titled, of the fact that the God of the Hebrews is not received by the Romans because his will is that he alone should be worshiped. Augustine uh, begins by noting that the pagan Romans have worshiped both evil and good deities. The question remains, why is the God of Israel alone not worshiped by them? Even the great philosopher Socrates contended that all gods should be worshipped and they should be worshipped in the manner that they desire to be worshipped. And Augustine concludes that the Romans, the pagan Romans, do not worship the God of Israel because if they did so according to God's command, they would have to reject all the other gods and risk offending them. And they would prefer uh, uh, not uh, offending the pagan deities than to receive the benefits of worshiping the one true God. In conclusion, we can see that there are at least two key issues that emerge in these chapters. First, Augustine is defending the apostles as authentic interpreters of the doctrine of Jesus. There is not a gap or a difference between the teaching of Jesus and the teaching of his authentic disciples. The teaching of the apostles is the teaching of Jesus. Second, the pagans reject Christianity because it is a faith in the God of the Bible who requires an exclusive devotion, and he, this God is one who does not tolerate the worship of other gods. Christianity is rejected by pagans because it is intolerant of other gods and other religions. Well, this brings this episode to a conclusion. I hope that this has been helpful and edifying to those who are listening, and I'll look forward to speaking to you in the next episode. Till then, take care and God bless.